In this video, I'll be introducing some of the properties of smooth maps. So let's start off with a definition of smooth maps. So say F here is a map between M, a smooth manifold, into N, a smooth manifold. We say F is smooth if for every P an element of M, there exists two smooth charts. U phi, a smooth chart on M, that is around P, and also a chart V psi on N, the output, around F of P. So, so we have this diagram which represents it. So what we do is we say it's smooth if phi inverse and then f and then psi, which is going to be a map from here to here, is then going to be a smooth map from phi of u into psi of v. So we already discussed this diagram, but I'm just restating it here. Now some equivalent definitions here is that for every chart u phi on M and v psi on N, that psi composed f composed phi inverse from phi of u into psi of v is smooth. This was the definition I originally introduced, and it's equivalent to this definition. It just removes the point because of invariance of smooth charts on smooth structures. That's what I proved last time, and that was the point of smooth structures, is so that this is an equivalent definition. Another equivalent definition is that we don't even need all of these charts. We don't even need the smooth structure, we just need a smooth atlas. So for a collection u alpha, phi alpha, for alpha and j, a smooth atlas on M and collection V beta psi beta or beta in I, a smooth atlas on N. So for any two smooth atlases, it is such that F is continuous and psi beta composed F, composed phi alpha inverse, from phi alpha of u alpha intersect f inverse of v beta into psi beta of v beta is smooth. So basically, we don't even need the smooth structure, we just need a smooth atlas. Another definition is that for every P and M, there exists U that contains P open, so some open neighborhood around P, such that F restricted to U is smooth. So locally being smooth, so that around every point you have an open interval such that it's smooth, is the same as being smooth. So those are a bunch of equivalent definitions, and now I'm going to introduce the gluing lemma. So if I have, so the gluing lemma, lemma one, is going to be that for M and N, so these are two smooth manifolds, um, and a collection U alpha for alpha in J, an open cover of M, and for each of these U alphas, we have a smooth F alpha from U alpha into N, such that these F alphas agree on the overlap. So F alpha around U alpha intersect U beta is going to be equal to F beta uh, restricted to U alpha intersect U beta. They agree on their overlaps. Then there exists a unique smooth F from M into N 
such that f restricted to u alpha is just f alpha. Basically meaning, I can glue a bunch of f alphas together. And that's just a corollary from all of these equivalent definitions. Okay, now this is going to be unrelated, but here are some properties of smooth maps. One, the constant map from m into n, which just sends p to some c an element of n. Every single p in m gets sent to the same constant in n. This constant map is smooth. Number two, the identity map from m to m is smooth. Number three is that for, uh, for open u subset of m, and we take the open submanifold on this, so for any open subset, um, the inclusion map, which is from u into m, is smooth. And then one more property is that if f is from m to n and is smooth, and then g is from n into p smooth, then g composed f from n into p is smooth. So constant maps are smooth, identity maps are smooth, inclusion maps are smooth, and then compositions are smooth. Now we can easily prove something uh, after we have all of these conditions and all of these equivalent definitions. There's something very easy that follows, some very easy maps that follow. First, one more equivalent definition. So f, which is going to be going from some n into a finite product of other manifolds, is smooth if and only if fi, the ith component, which is just the ith projection composed f, which is from n into mi, is smooth for i equals 1 to k. So f is smooth if and only if its components are smooth. Proof. So the proof here is that um, forward direction. fi, fi is pi i composed f, a composition of smooth maps because pi i is smooth and f is smooth by hypothesis. Okay, backwards, the converse. f is going to be the product f1 to fk. It's going to be the product of all of its components or um, if you don't know what that means, it means that f of x is just going to be the um, set of f1 of x until fk of x. So it's just made up of its components. This is very easy to see. Okay, so now let's check that f is smooth. So I have psi composed f composed phi inverse. What I'm going to do is I'm going to represent two of these maps as their components. So I'm going to have psi 1 to psi k because psi here is going to be a chart on m1 to mk which under the product smooth structure we just get psi 1 to psi k. Its component functions are also going to be are going to be charts. Because psi is going to be a map from m1 to mk down to rn, I can take its component functions. Composed and then I'm going to have f1 to fk and then I'm just going to have phi inverse. Very easily, you can see that this is going to be equal to psi 1 composed f1 composed phi inverse all the way up until psi k composed fk composed phi inverse. Reason why these are smooth is because psi 1 is going to be a chart on m1. This is from the definition of the product of manifolds. Psi k is going to be a chart on mk. So this is just looking at the coordinate representation of f1, which we know is going to be smooth. Another way you could look at it is that psi 1 is smooth, f1 is smooth, phi inverse is smooth. This is just the, comp uh, this is the composition of smooth functions. So therefore, this entire thing, which is just a bunch of smooth functions, is going to be smooth. 
Okay, so some nice examples that arrive from this, just very easily, is going to be any map F from a zero dimensional manifold into any other dimensional manifold is smooth. Because a zero dimensional manifold is just a finite set on the discrete topology, very easy to check. Okay, second example, which is going to be a map from R into S1 defined by epsilon of t equals e to the 2 pi i t. It's just, just going around the circle. You can check that this is, in fact, a smooth map. And then there's also another one, epsilon n, a map from rn into the n torus defined by epsilon n of x1 to xn is going to be equal to e to the 2 pi i x1 all the way up until e to the 2 pi i xn. So this is just the product of these maps, which is then going to be smooth under this. Now, uh, another one which is a little harder to check, the inclusion map from Sn minus 1 into Rn is going to be smooth. I'm not going to prove that, but it's easy to check. Number five, the quotient map, which is from Rn removing, Rn plus 1 removing the origin into the real projective space is smooth. Okay, these are five nice examples. So now we say a map F from M into N is diffeomorphic, which is like an isomorphism for smooth manifolds if F is bijective and F and F inverse are smooth. So a diffeomorphism is like an isomorphism in that it's bijective and in its inverse are like these structure preserving maps. Okay, some very easy properties is that the composition of diffeomorphic maps are diffeomorphic, the product of diffeomorphic maps are diffeomorphic, the finite product that these are homeomorphisms and open maps, if you know what those are. The restriction of diffeomorphisms to open submanifolds is going to be a uh, diffeomorphism onto its image. Now what we usually write is that M is diffeomorphic to N if there exists a diffeomorphism between them. So it's creating an equivalence class on all the smooth manifolds. Okay, so now there's two different types of invariants here. Suppose M is diffeomorphic to N by some map here, F. Okay? This is a diffeomorphism from M to N. Then, 1, the dimension of M equals the dimension of N. 2, F of the boundary on M is equal to the boundary on N. Okay, this is for smooth manifolds with boundary, okay? I forgot to mention that. And then also, that F restricted to the interior on M is a diffeomorphism from the interior of M into the interior on N. I'm going to prove the first one. The second one is up to you to prove. First, um, what I'm just going to write is that dimension of M equals M and dimension n equals n. Suppose I have charts u phi on m and v psi on n. Then I'm going to have psi composed f composed phi inverse, which is going to be a map from phi of u, a subset of r m into psi of V, a subset of R, N. So this is a diffeomorphism. As you can check, it's, it and its inverse are smooth from phi of U into psi of V. So now, how, where's the contradiction here? Well, there cannot be a diffeomorphism from Rm to Rn, unless M is equal to N. So let's suppose F is going to be a function or a diffeomorphism from an open subset 
of R and I'm gonna switch N and M here just for brevity into some subset of R M. Well then what I'm going to look at is F composed F inverse which is going to be the identity on V and also F inverse composed F which is the identity on U. And I'm also going to look at something called the total derivative. I'm not going to explain it here but you should know it. It's a linear function that takes in a um, function like this and it acts as a derivative. What we do is we say that the identity on Rn is going to be the total derivative of the identity on U, U a, an open subset, at a point A in U. Now what I can do here is then this is going to be the total derivative of F inverse composed F at A, which then I'm going to say that this is the total derivative of F inverse at f of a, because f is right there, this is the chain rule, and then composed the total derivative of f at a. And then similarly, the identity on Rm is going to be the total derivative of the identity on v at, uh, at f of a, which is then going to be equal to the total derivative of f composed f inverse of f of a, which is then going to be the total derivative of f applied to a, because f inverse of f of a is a. And then compose this with the total derivative of f inverse just applied to f of a. Hmm. So df inverse of f of a composed df at a is the identity, and df at a composed df inverse at f of a is the identity. So that means that df as a whole, because I did this for arbitrary a, has an inverse. And that inverse is just df inverse. df has an inverse, which is a linear function. Well, that means that df is an isomorphism. But every isomorphism has to have it that the two vector spaces it's going between have the same dimension, which means that m is equal to n. So this use of this linear function, which I haven't described, is very important. So if you want to learn about that, uh, maybe I'll make another video on it. And that's it. Fine sword to major Steve.